Okay, great. Um, well, good afternoon. Uh, those of you who are thinking, haven't we heard enough from this guy already today? Uh, believe me, I totally agree. Um, <laughs> this was an accident of scheduling that um, I apologize for. And um, I also need to apologize to Bert because despite what he just said about manuscript submission systems, I don't know anything about manuscript <laughs> submission systems. So, and I told him that, um, but I'm going to make a reference to that in passing and, I, and I'm going to look to Bert to expand some of that um, as, uh, afterwards. What I really would like to talk about though is um, peer review, which as you all know is a central plank in the structure of scientific communication, but currently under some discussion. Um, this is a picture taken as I walked alongside a Chinese lake. Uh, that's why the sign says what it says. Um, so there are lots of people who think that the peer review system as currently practiced in science and medicine is broken at best and terminally so at worst, and some of these people are very prominent. I'm not going to read each of these, these quotes, but here's Richard Horton very recently weighing in, basically saying that um, the literature, really, perhaps half of it, may simply be untrue. Here's Richard Smith, another med prominent medical editor who's got a lot of adjectives to describe um, uh, peer review. Uh, wasteful, biased, irrelevant, etc. Apart from that, though, it is pretty perfect. <laughs> um, Marsha Angel, um, a very sober critic of the medical establishment in this country, uh, says it's no longer possible to believe much of what is published in clinical journals. And Mike Eisen, the inimitable Mike Eisen, um, I won't repeat this quote, I've done enough profanity for one day, I think. Um, but basically, Mike thinks that peer review is, at worst, something that gets in the way of the march of science. So, um, against this, there are a lot of people who resist uh, this kind of criticism, and most of the time they use a variant on the Churchillian um, uh, metaphor here that um, comparing it to democracy and that basically okay it may be imperfect but it's the best we have um, however there are a whole bunch of people who are of improving it and we'll talk about that in just a second if you actually ask the scientists then and this has been done quite extensively in the form of surveys involving thousands of, of uh, participants and if you look back over the last seven or eight years, these are the surveys that have been done by various organizations. And the general consensus view is um, pretty, much, pretty standard. Um, a large proportion of the, scientific, the research community believe that the peer review system is okay, that it actually helps uh, improve their papers even when the paper is rejected as a result of the peer review process. And um, they are, on the whole, fairly satisfied. And one thing that, to add to this is that they don't think there is an adequate alternative. However, 30% or so believe it could be improved, and some, as you can see, believe that it is indeed sustainable as the scientific community grows internationally and the, and the output of science increases as it is doing by about 3 to 5% per year. Um, in various ways, there are, have been uh, suggestions for improving it, uh, having more reviewers do it, uh, training people in how to do it, improving how you match up papers and reviewers, making it faster, a constant complaint, and um, changing the rules as far as anonymity is concerned, double blinding simply meaning that when someone is asked to review a paper, they are not told who the authors are. So the question is, what should peer review do? And here are a list of things that, conventionally speaking, peer review is expected to do. Certainly improve the quality of the paper, um, determine the importance of the findings, and acknowledge previous work, detect falsification and plagiarism, but most particularly, uh, it's a mechanism that allows journal editors to choose the manuscripts that best suit their journal. 
However, in these surveys, most people think that it doesn't do all of these things as well as it should do, and certainly not when it comes to fraud and plagiarism. And here is a, a sort of summary statement from a very recent uh, survey, a very good report, which I recommend you read. It's freely available. Um, basically saying that peer review is very important to the scientific enterprise, but there are problems with it. And funders, too, have um, essentially come to the same conclusion and made some of the same recommendations. And here is another little set of things that could be employed to try to improve the process, including uh, link sharing and commenting, including the use of social media and preprints, which I shall come back to in a second. So I'm going to skate through some um, innovations that are being tried by a bunch of different organizations. There isn't time to describe them all or even name the journals who are doing some pioneering work in this area. Um, and I, I know that my colleagues on the, this panel will say more about what they in particular are doing. But again, without wanting to read through each of these points, um, you can see that there are a variety of new and different things being published. Some of it involves openness and transparency, um, including publishing reviews alongside papers. Um, some of it involves moving reviews from journal to journal. Some of it involves extra steps, which includes having particularly qualified people look at the data, look at the statistics, and also the use of um, the software for detecting plagiarism, and an increasingly important issue, looking at figures to see to what extent they have been manipulated, not necessarily for fraudulent reasons, but to sort of make the picture look better. Um, and I know Joel is going to be talking a bit about procedures for validating authors and reviewers. In, in other words, ensuring that one knows who they actually are. Um, in addition, there are a number of companies which have set up to provide publishers with independent platforms for peer review. They all work slightly differently. Um, the founder of one of them is waving ecstatically out in the hallway there. Um, they work slightly differently. They, work in, they don't work across all fields. And some of them include mechanisms for giving credit to those who do the reviews. This is an increasingly important issue that people, young people in particular, want the recognition that they are putting this effort into the community. And there are various ways in which that can happen. There may be people in this room who are far more familiar with how these systems work, and I hope if, they, if you are here, then you will speak up on their behalf. There are also post-publication mechanisms, uh, again, a growing variety of them. Uh, most journals have commenting functions now, they're almost uniformly not very extensively used. PubMed Commons is a, an attempt to centralize comments um, being had, that was set up by PubMed. There, I, I think there are about 1,000 comments now, um, not a tremendous number when you consider how uh, many more papers are going into PubMed each, each month or each year. PubMed, PubPeer, you may have come across, so rather it's quite, has achieved a degree of notoriety by being a place where people can post anonymous criticisms of papers, and, and they have received a great deal of exposure because they, have, they seem to have succeeded in actually uncovering um, fraud in, in certain situations. Um, so that's, an, that's another addition to the, to the post-publication arena. Uh, ResearchGate and Academia.edu are places where you can comment on papers as, as you wish, and Science Open um, is uh, an aggregator of open access papers where, once again, you, uh, there is an encouragement to actually make your own comments on, on papers that are being collected there. Selectedpapers.net is something specific for physics, and it's kind of an, an interesting idea that you basically follow someone whose work, whose opinions on things you like, and when that person earmarks a paper as good, then you are alerted to the fact that that, that has happened. But that is a very small enterprise and specific to physics. So what has Cold Spring Harbor done to assist in this um, effort to improve uh, peer review? Um, well, we've done really only one thing, and that is to launch a preprint server for biology 
which we did uh, about 18 months ago now, and it is called BioArchive in frank homage to the existence of the Physics Archive, uh, which has been going now for about 25 years. So Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory is a place that is active in all forms of scientific activity, not just research, but we have conferences and courses, so we have lots of visitors. Uh, each year we have a graduate school and we have a pro program for teaching high school kids genetics, and the press is um, a professional publisher of eight journals and a, and a book program. So we get the chance to talk to a lot of scientists, and we have been doing that for a good deal of time. For 10 years, um, there's been a discussion in our shop about why a preprint server works in physics but not in biology. But about two years ago, we began to, we felt, detect a change in the community that there was more openness to the idea of preprints among biologists. And this is the kind of reason that scientists, these are the reasons that scientists gave us for their impatience with the current ver uh, way that peer review operates. So we, um, we also noticed that more and more biology was appearing on the physics archive. So thanks to an enlightened leadership at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, we got the opportunity to begin BioArchive, which is a not-for-profit service. It's, what it does is make manuscripts uh, available free. Uh, they can be submitted to BioArchive free of charge. Um, we have a, a modest screening process just to reassure us that what is being posted is actually science. Authors can revise their manuscripts anytime they like, and believe me, they do. Um, there is no connection with a journal, Cold Spring Harbor or otherwise, and it covers 24 topics that collectively represent biology. So this is not a very good picture of what the homepage looks like or the, 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 uh, this, the uh, unrolling advance of manuscripts as they, as they get posted on the server. Um, the features, uh, again, I'm going quickly here, so I'm not going to talk about every single aspect of this, but we do have, thanks to Highwire and, and Bert and his colleagues in particular, we have a, an automated manuscript submission system, which maybe Bert will talk more about. It's lightweight in the sense that it works much more um, swiftly than the standard manuscript submission system does. Um, any manuscript that goes through it is date stamped, it's given a DOI. Um, authors are allowed to um, tell us whether they, what kind of article they think it is. Is it new results? Is it confirmatory? Is it uh, contradictory? This is a response to the much known difficulty of publishing certain kinds of results, negative results and confirmatory results in particular. We have a range of licenses that authors may choose. Um, the output is indexed in Google Scholar. We offer metrics of different kinds, and we offer commenting. Um, and also, and I think this is shown in the next slide, um, you can see various forms of link. In red at the top there, that's an indicator that there is a revised version that can be seen uh, if you click on that link. And down at the bottom under the abstract, you can see we are making links to the final versions of manuscripts that are published in journals. And there are various other things. You can see the social media activity and the, the, the button for getting the PDF download there. So after 18 months, where have we reached? So we've, we're about 1,600 manuscripts, and every month is giving us more, a, a, larger, um, a larger number, a, a larger rate of submission. Um, every subject category in science is, in biology is represented, most encouragingly, including disciplines that have not really had any exposure to the idea of preprints before. Um, these manuscripts come from all over the world and from many, many different institutions. The rate of revision, to me, is very surprising. It's running. 10% um, of those manuscripts have comments on them and we're seeing increased usage in the form of page views and downloads, and we're tracking the published versions of these manuscripts, and obviously at any one time they are in, in process. So, um, but at the moment about 30% of these manuscripts have actually been published in a whole range of journals, some of which I've listed at the bottom there. Um, 
In addition to the commenting on the site, there is a great deal of um, social media comment. So Twitter is a particularly useful place for people to discover um, these posted manuscripts. There are also a variety of blogs which feature uh, preprints. Um, and, but most particularly, authors tell us they are getting a lot of direct feedback via email. Some of it is asking for further details, some of it is pointing out flaws or suggestions of how things could be improved. So after 18 months, we are seeing a change in behavior in the research community, just simply using communities using preprints who did not use preprints before. The rate is increasing and the revision rate is also increasing. Um, more and more journals um, are removing their prohibitions on reviewing manuscripts that have been posted on a preprint server. And the NIH Biosketch, which is an important thing for grant applicants, can now improve, uh, include a, a reference to a, a manuscript, to a, um, a preprinted manuscript because it has a DOI and the reviewers of the grant can look it up. We're also working with a variety of other uh, journal publishers to integrate the process of deposition of manuscripts on BioArchive with the, with the submission of manuscripts to, uh, to the journals. Um, we've done this so far with um, the Genetic Society of America and uh, also with one of our own journals and we're doing more. So what are the benefits of a preprint and how does it sort of feed into the topic of discussion here? Well, obviously, it's a mechanism for getting your results out more quickly so that the community can see what you've done and give you feedback. Um, it, despite the concerns about scooping, in fact, it's an anti-scooping mechanism. And depending on the community and depending on, how, on time, it may qualify you to be the owner of an idea or a discovery. That's not something we can legislate, that's a community decision. Um, it certainly provides early career scientists who haven't had a chance to build up a corpus of work with um, material that they can point to when they're applying for a job or applying for a grant. Um, and that certainly is very helpful. The, the submission and the, the, the feedback and the discussion we think is possibly helping with this question of, of, of peer review because people are getting feedback. There, seem to be, uh, there seems to be quite a lot of it. We haven't quantified that completely yet, um, but there seems to be a lot of it. And in general, the tone is constructive, collegial. You know, if you've spent any time on commenting sites, you know how quickly the snark factor uh, uh, appears, and that really has not been the case on BioArchive, not, and not because we've edited them out either. So there are more eyes on a manuscript before it gets submitted and informally placed in the journal system, and the question for us, and we are beginning to believe this might be true, is that it helps with, rep it may help with reproducibility, which might mean fewer retractions, which might mean that when peer review is done at the journal level, then it's easier to do because maybe some of the most obvious flaws have been ironed out. And of course, because BioArchive is not connected to any particular journal, um, then the author is free to take the manuscript wherever she wishes to send it. So. Um, what, do, what do we, lessons do we take home from this whole question of innovation and peer review? Again, this is another um, summary statement from that report that I mentioned. And essentially, it, what it, it's saying is, um, do what the community, to publishers, it's saying, do what the community wants you to do. Don't get too far ahead, don't get too clever, because if, if you do and the scientists don't want to do it, they won't. And then your work will have been for naught and as they say at the bottom here, unless you define the purpose with clarity, then all this experimentation may prove to be of little point. And this reminds me of this famous quote from Machiavelli, who basically says that he who innovates will have for his enemies all those who are well off under the existing order of things and only lukewarm support from those who might be better off under the new. In other words, 
you can always tell the pioneer by the arrows in her back. <laughs> so that is my contribution. <laughs> Thank you.